everyone and welcome into week four of DFS. This is the Adjusted Line Play Report presented by Zilla Fantasy Elite. I am your host, Todd Hoffman. You can find Zilla Fantasy Elite over on Twitter at Zilla Fantasy. You can find myself on Twitter at Toddzilla1337. Today's show is brought to you by Bang Energy, where you fuel your destiny. Looking to get a bit more bang for your buck in DFS this year? Look no further than Bang Energy to fuel your destiny while watching the Adjusted Line Play Report presented by Zilla Fantasy Elite and hosted by Todd Hoffman. Bang Energy, fuel your destiny. Today's flavor from Bang Energy is my favorite, Pina Colada. Ooh, it is very, very tasty. Let's open this guy up. Oh, that's delicious. Again, bang energy. Feel your destiny, folks. Oh, that's good stuff. All right, as always, uh, clearly I'm not sponsored. I don't have a ton of people following me yet, but at some point, perhaps I'll be sponsored by bang or some sort of energy drink. Uh, let's get this underway. For week four DFS slate, guys, again, we have quite a few high totals this week. I think we have five games over 50. Let's look here. One, two, three, four, five. Yes, five games that are over 50 this week. So again, lots and lots of plays with lots and lots of points for this week, which will be very nice. And as always, we're going to start with the highest game totals on the slate and work our way down from there. Very first one is Kansas City at Philadelphia. They are actually tied for first according to the Vegas lines at 54 and a half point over under. And as you can see, Kansas City are seven point road favorites against Philadelphia. Now let's look at the road team here first. Kansas City, they should be able to make the ball or should be able to move the ball on the ground. So we look at their Offensive pass protection is actually six, which is pretty good. But Philadelphia is number seventh in the uh, pass rush defense there, so they're getting after the quarterback quite a bit. That's kind of a wash there, but where they're going to make up their ground, Kansas City, middle of the road, 16th in offensive run blocking. But Philadelphia, only 28th in the adjusted uh, rushing yards department on defense there. So Kansas City should be able to move the ball on the ground uh, just fine. Uh, kind of similar that to the situation that they had last week. Uh, last week was kind of a CEH game where uh, he had over 100 yards rushing, scored a touchdown, I believe, through the air. So this could be another one of those CEH games, uh, especially if it's going to be in a high total game environment. Expect him possibly to get another touchdown here um, and move the ball efficiently on the ground. Otherwise, we see Kansas City's pass protection as kind of a wash and if you think Philadelphia is going to be able to get after them or um, anything like that, then we're probably looking at shorter routes for Kansas City, which you know could lead to some more CEH, Clyde Edwards, Hilaire touch or uh, touches uh, via the pass attack, or as always, Travis Kelsey on those underneath and intermediate routes. Uh, very popular. If you think Kansas City's number six pass protection is going to hold the line. Perhaps you can get some of those longer bombs to Tyree Kill. Um, he is also pretty adept at getting open regardless. So um, those those guys are always in play. And obviously at 54.5 point total, um, Mahomes, Tyree Kill, and Kelsey probably going to be played quite a bit uh, this week in DFS. Just keep that in mind. A way to get different, especially in the GPP, is Clyde Edwards-Hilaire. He did have a, a pretty good week last week. So uh, keep that in mind. So with that being said, Philadelphia, we see there they've got about a 24-point implied total. Kansas City's, I think, second on the slate at 30.75 there for the team implied total. But uh, Philadelphia should be better at moving the ball through the air, which is good because if we expect Kansas City to be blowing them out by seven points or more, Philadelphia is probably going to have to be passing. But if we look first at their run blocking, they're number 22 in run blocking. Kansas City is 29th in the adjusted line yards. So that's somewhat of a wash, a little bit in favor of Philadelphia. So maybe they can move the ball on the ground a little bit. 
Everyone's been able to do that against Kansas City so far this year. Uh, Philadelphia might not be any different. It's just that their run blocking on offense is not very good. But we look at their pass protection on offense, 13th Kansas City, also 29th in the defense against pass rush. They're not generating a whole lot of sacks and situations other than what you would expect. So they're not necessarily getting after the quarterback too well. This could favor Jalen Hurts uh, and the pass game there in Philadelphia this week. Uh, with that being said, Hurts, Devonta Smith, uh, Quez Watkins is another one. He's been super, super efficient with his targets. Another, um, other than those two at wide receiver, Rager has been getting a lot of targets. He just hasn't been doing a lot with them. So if I'm going to be playing any sort of GPP lineup with Hertz, it's probably going to be Devonta Smith and Quez Watkins or Devonta Smith or Quez Watkins with one of the tight ends there. We did see Dallas Goddard have a okay first three weeks here, and then Zach Ertz actually scored a touchdown last week on four receptions, I believe. So uh, keep that in mind. I think Philadelphia will be able to move the ball fairly efficiently against Kansas City, and I could see this one turning into uh, a pretty high game total here, especially with Kansas City being able to move the ball on the ground and um, just do what they do in the pass game as well. So keep that in mind. I, I do like stacking this game as far as Philadelphia is concerned, getting a Hertz stack with either Devonta Smith or possibly two of those and then running it back with CEH. Um, not that bad of an idea there. Anyway, that's the first game on the slate. Let's hit up the other one. That was a 54 and a half game uh, over under. It's number 11 here. Arizona at Los Angeles Rams. Again, that's a 54 and a half point over under. The Rams are four and a half point home favorites um, in this game. So let's take a peek at the away team here, which is Arizona. Uh, the pass protection's slightly better than the run game here. So we look at their offensive uh, run blocking. It's number 12, the Rams 15th in the adjusted uh, rushing yards department. So that's kind of a wash. Arizona doesn't have a super strong uh, rush game anyway. They have Edmonds there and James Conner. Neither of those are anybody that I'm necessarily looking to play in either cash or a tournament. Um, as I just don't see the upside for either one of those two. But then you look at the pass protection for Arizona. It's number eight. The Rams still 15th there in generating a pass rush on defense. So Arizona is more than likely going to have to move the ball through the air. The thing to remember about the Rams, though, is that they have Jalen Ramsey. He is pretty much a shutdown corner. He's either going to be on an injured DeAndre Hopkins with his ribs or if A.J. Green is filling in for Hopkins and Hopkins isn't getting as much run as you would like, he's going to be on A.J. Green. So I'd expect those two to have uh, poorer weeks this week and then having Christian Kirk and Rondale Moore probably be able to be the ones that are going to be moving the ball through the air for Arizona this week. Keep that in mind. And with a 54.5 point total or over under su suggested here, um, you could probably play Kyler in this particular situation uh, with those pass catchers. Just be aware that um, he's not probably the juiciest play um, this week, but he does score points week in and week out. So with that being said, let's look at the Los Angeles Rams. Their run blocking is better than their pass protection situation here. So look at their pass protection. They're actually number two overall in offensive pass protection, but Arizona is getting after the quarterback, number five in the defensive pass rush. So that's kind of a wash. I wouldn't expect the Rams to have an absolute ton of time to be passing the ball, but if we look at their run blocking. They're number sixth in run blocking. Arizona's 20th in the adjusted yards on defense for rushing, and they have been the last few weeks been getting ran all over. So with that, Henderson has been kind of injured with the rib cartilage problem, which means if Sony Michelle is the lone back over there in Rams country. I could see him being a very sneaky play this week in a high game total where he could end up getting you, you know, 80 to 100 yards rushing, maybe a few receptions, as we've seen him do that in college, um, but not necessarily in the pros yet when he was with the Patriots. However, the Rams aren't the Patriots, and it's a different scheme there. So 
Michelle, Sony Michelle could be a very interesting play, especially in GPPs. I don't think there's going to be a lot of people on him. If Henderson doesn't play, he's going to be a, a sneaky play for me. Um, and maybe even more sneaky if Henderson does play because he's probably not going to get that much volume. And then a lot more people will be off of Sony Michelle in this high game total environment, which, as I said, is tied for first this week. So watch out for Sony Michelle. Obviously, the pass game, if you think they're going to be just fine against Arizona's pass rush, or if you think they're going to be getting after the Rams in general, like the shorter, shorter underneath routes are probably going to be favored, which is Cooper Cup yet again. The dude has dominated for three weeks straight. And I don't see why anything would necessarily change against Arizona uh, given this matchup. So Cup could be someone of interest uh, for myself in this as well. All right, let's move on to the third game, which is Seattle at San Francisco. It's actually just below here, game number 12. It's a 52-point over-under. San Francisco are three-point home favorites. Now, this is an interesting one for me. Um, we'll take a peek at Seattle first here. Um, their run blocking is number four versus 14. So Seattle should be able to move the ball on the ground against San Francisco just fine, which makes Carson yet again another sneaky uh, play. He has produced touchdowns the last two weeks. He had two touchdowns in week two, one touchdown last week. Um, I don't see why this would be any different here. Another high game total. I could see Carson scoring yet another touchdown in this game um, as well. So uh, the, the interesting part is Seattle's, you know, 25th in offensive pass protection, so not very good. But San Francisco's only 21st at generating a pass rush, so they're not very good either. It's kind of a wash there. And typically with the adjusted line play report, when it's a wash in a situation like this, you just go with the guys that are going to score you fantasy points. And we've seen already San Francisco – their secondary is not very good. They could easily get torched here by Tyler Lockett and DK Metcalf. Now Lockett is coming off of an injury. It sounds like he should be able to play this week, but if he doesn't, I think Gerald Everett has already been ruled out at Seattle, so Metcalf would be somebody who could absolutely blow up for a few touchdowns in this particular matchup. Watch Seattle to move the ball both via the ground with Carson and through the air with Metcalf and possibly Carson on the ground as well. I do like those two in particular and Russ Wilson in this particular matchup just because San Francisco's secondary has been so poor, especially if Tyler Lockett plays. Look for Wilson to have a monster game. I could see him easily getting a touchdown pass to <coughs> excuse me, any of the aforementioned people, Chris Carson, Tyler Lockett, or DK Metcalf. Bang. Fuel your destiny. How about that? <clears throat> My destiny is a clean and crisp throat, not dry. Let's plug that up. All right. And as you guys, if you watch the uh, week three, um, you notice that I mentioned something about having cancer and having a surgery. I did have that a few days ago, so you can kind of see a little white patch. <laughs> Right there. Anyway, let's cover that up. <clears throat> Probably why my throat's a little bit dry, but that's the Seattle matchup for me. I think all Seahawks are pretty much in play here. Um, Russell Wilson, Chris Carson, Tyler Lockett, DK Metcalf. And as I said before, I believe Gerald Everett has already been ruled out for this week. So keep that in mind. I think it's just going to funnel more passes to the wide receivers there and Chris Carson. So on the San Francisco side, we have the pass protections a little bit better. And um, we take a peek at the offensive pass protection here. So 12 versus 20. Seattle's not really getting after the quarterback. And then the run blocking is kind of a wash. 15 versus 16. However, San Francisco's having a bunch of injuries on their running back squad. Um, sounds like Elijah Mitchell might be back this week. Might not be if he is back. He's probably going to be limited and he's just going to eat into the carries and overall production of all of the running backs there. I don't like the running back situation in San Francisco this week, even though that is a wash type situation. I expect San Francisco to actually move the ball through the air, which is good if Seattle is going to be moving the ball and scoring a lot of points. San Francisco, I think, will be able to move the ball through the air a little bit better than on the ground. 
With that being said, Jimmy Garoppolo might be in play here as a sneaky dart throw uh, option or a run back type of situation with the Seattle on the run back there. So the only hesitation I have about that is Trey Lance getting in uh, at particular times, like third down, third and one, or towards the red zone. They take Jimmy Garoppolo out and put Trey Lance in, which caps Jimmy Garoppolo's upside. With that being said, it doesn't necessarily cap the upside of the pass catchers, and I would assume Brandon Ayuk, George Kittle, and Debo Samuel will have a pretty nice week this week against Seattle. Um, and as I said, watch for the running back. Like If Eli Mitchell returns, it's just going to submarine, I think, all the running backs in that particular on the San Francisco 49ers. And I think they're going to end up moving the ball through the air. So I could see this being a, a nice George Kittle week and Ayuk and Debo Samuel getting quite a few uh, carries potentially as they try to not lean on their running backs as much as they have in the past there. So that's the Seattle-San Francisco game. Let's get on to the number four highest point total on the slate, which is Cleveland at Minnesota. Right here, game number five. Cleveland, 51.5 uh, over under here, as I said, Cleveland's actually two point road favorites here at the Dome in Minnesota, which is very interesting. And actually, I want to say before uh, we move on to this, the Seattle and San Francisco game, I actually have Seattle just the way that the adjusted line play report is coming out. San Francisco's three point home favorites, I would take Seattle on that if you're placing bets or sort of parlays and you want to get uh, some plus money, I would put it on Seattle beating San Francisco this week at San Francisco. I think that's a, a pretty safe bet. Anyhow, Cleveland at Minnesota, 51.5 point over under. Cleveland, two-point road favorites. Let's look at their situation first. We look at offensive pass protection. Cleveland is 30th. That is really bad. Minnesota, number six in the pass rush on defense, which is really good. I don't expect Cleveland to be passing the ball very efficient, excuse me, very efficiently in this matchup, which means we want to look at the run attack. Cleveland, number two in offensive run blocking. Minnesota, 30th in adjusted rush yards against uh, the run. And that looks like a smash, absolute, absolute smash matchup. For Cleveland, look for Chubb and Hunt probably to smash and just go in and destroy everything. Leroy uh, Jenkins! Matchup. I think we had the Leroy Jenkins sound playing there for them. They could just go solo and crush everyone. Um, let's give that another. Leroy yeah, I expect that to be Chubb and Hunt just going to town on Minnesota this week. Um, in the Dome, I expect them to have a pretty high rushing total this week, which um, is kind of good for this 51.5 point over under as we look at Minnesota. So Cleveland, that's pretty much, um, they're just going to run the ball over Minnesota and struggle in the pass game. So I expect them to just continue to run. Um, Chubb could see one of those 150-yard two-touchdown games. Hunt gets in there um, and is also very efficient. But in order to do that and score a lot of points, I think Minnesota needs to also do their part and make this a shootout. Luckily for us, we see their offensive pass protection is third. Cleveland is number two against the pass rush. However, that's a little bit inflated as they had nine or nine and a half sacks last week against Chicago with that terrible game plan and the Justin Fields debut there. They were not getting after the quarterback whatsoever until that particular matchup with Chicago. I think this number two line is a little bit inflated. So I think Minnesota is going to have a lot more time to pass the ball than what this would suggest. Either way, it's a wash, and you would expect just your usual people to perform. So Kirk Cousins, Justin Jefferson, Adam Thielen, and Tyler Conklin, I think, are all in play this week. We look at the uh, the run blocking for Minnesota. It's number 18 versus Cleveland 5. They were pretty stout against the, the run, I believe, prior uh, to this week anyway. So I don't expect Minnesota to be able to run the ball as efficiently as they had. Delvin Cook, if he does come back, probably going to be a little bit hobbled. 
Otherwise, Alexander Madison will be in there for him. I just don't see him having quite the talent necessary to run all over this Cleveland defense. So I think Minnesota is going to have to move the ball through the air a little bit. And if you think Cleveland's going to get after Minnesota and they're going to repeat what they did in Chicago, expect Minnesota to actually make some adjustments and just throw shorter passes, which would favor Tyler Conklin. Um, really, Thielen and Jefferson can both get open at will. And also the running back. So if Delvin Cook is in there and healthy, which I doubt, but if he's in there and healthy or Madison's in there and healthy, I believe they will see an uptick in targets as well if you think Cleveland's going to be getting after the quarterback there. However, I do like the chances of Cleveland running all over Minnesota and then Minnesota bringing it back on offense and uh, kind of blasting Cleveland through the air with the air attack there and Kirk Cousins kind of being viable in that situation. So keep that in mind. It's a very interesting matchup. We have Cleveland just going to be running the ball through Minnesota's throats, and then Minnesota, I think, will be able to move the ball efficiently um, through the air. I think this number two uh, number from Cleveland is a little bit inflated from their Chicago uh, their Chicago game. They were, I think they only had two sacks or three sacks in the two games prior to that Chicago game, and they were one of the worst at generating a pass rush. So keep that in mind. I think Minnesota is going to be just fine in the, in the pass attack there. With that being said, let's get to the number five game on the slate. This is the last game at a 50 or more total which is carolina at dallas this is still one of the early games we have a 50 and a half point over under with dallas four and a half point home favorites against carolina now we'll look at the carolina side first offensive pass protection 14th dallas pass rush 31st so it looks like carolina will be able to move the ball quite efficiently through the air which is good if we want a shootout situation we look at the run blocking we have chuba hubbard uh subbing in for an injured christian mccaffrey this week so we should get one solid week of free square for uh, chuba this week uh with that being said i don't expect them to be able to run the ball super well against dallas they are 24th in offensive run blocking while dallas is 25th that's kind of a wash um, compared to what they might be used to, Carolina might be able to move the ball a little bit easier than what they're used to. However, I expect them to move the ball through the air with their 14th ranked offense and pass protection and Dallas's 31st ranked uh, pass rush on the quarterback. Expect them to move the ball through the air, which would be Sam Darnold, DJ Moore. With CMC being out, the target concentration is just going to probably consolidate even more on DJ Moore. And then look for uh, Darnold to actually have a pretty solid week this week. And then instead of CMC, we're going to have Chuba in there. I think he's very capable of receiving four or five targets in this game, uh, especially if he's going to have some time. He might see some open space there, and he does have pretty solid speed to get away from people. So Hubbard could be one explosive play away from a big week this week in DFS as well. And if this is going to be a shootout, he could score more than one touchdown. But I would expect DJ Moore and Sam Darnold, and Darnold actually being a very sneaky play this week against Dallas. I don't know what his roster ship percentage is going to look like, but um, he could be a very sneaky play with DJ Moore. Or you could do a, a skinny stack, which apparently Dallas has gone down in price after last week. So you could run a Dallas stack out there and run it back with DJ Moore on on the other side which would be good uh, let's move on to dallas uh, they should be more successful running than passing actually so we look at their run blocking it's number one uh, versus carolina is actually number one on defense for both adjusted rush yards and the defensive pass rush so expect dallas to kind of be under siege a little bit on the pass attack and expect them to have a little bit more success running the ball than passing the ball uh, with that being said, I think Dallas isn't uh, a dummy team. I don't think they have a bad offensive coordinator there. If they're moving the ball on the ground, I think they're just going to continue to pound Zeke and Pollard on the ground and kind of beat Carolina to death. 
via the run game. So I would expect this to be more of a Zeke and Pollard week than necessarily a Dak and CD Lamb and Amari Cooper week. So keep that in mind. Dallas should be kind of under siege in the past past game, but Carolina did lose J.C. Horn uh, to an injury that could be playing an effect onto their secondary, which does open up opportunity for Dak and that pass game. I, I just think they're going to find a little bit more success in the ground game, and we saw them kind of pound the rock last week in a, in a vital victory there. So that's kind of what I'm looking at for the, the Dallas side is more of the run game than the pass game. Should be an interesting setup either way with J.C. Horn being out in Carolina. Let's look at the number six highest game total on the slate, which is Washington at Atlanta. They're game number two here. So we drop from 50 and a half all the way down to 48. Uh, two and a half point over under compared to the last one. And we're starting to move into games where you maybe don't want to game stack quite as much. Washington at Atlanta being the number six game on the slate. You probably want those top five games if you're going to be doing game stacks of any sort, but uh, this is probably the final one um, that you're going to want any sort of stack with a run back, uh, potentially, uh, outside of maybe Houston and Buffalo, which we'll get to after this. But 48 point over under, we have Washington actually has one and a half point road favorites over Atlanta. This is in a dome. Washington should be able to move the ball in offense. That is the main takeaway here. Number one in offensive pass protection for Washington. Atlanta just middle of the road on generating pressure against the quarterback. Washington number eight in offensive run blocking. Atlanta, again, middle of the road in adjusted rush yards on defense. I expect Washington to be able to move the ball at will on Atlanta that's in a dome. I fully expect Gibson to have a monster week. This is Sparta! He absolutely crushed everyone on his one target um, last week. Just kicked everyone right in the teeth, sunk them into the hole, and basically took that rock 70-some yards to the house on one target. I expect more of the same this week for Mr. Antonio Gibson. Uh, with that being said, and Washington being able to move the ball very well, I would expect McLaurin to also, uh, Terry McLaurin, to have a solid week this week. Uh, perhaps Logan Thomas as well, and I'm probably not going to run the quarterback out there um, for Washington. Just I, I think there's better matchups here. Um, but those three are one-offs that I would put into a lineup. I fully expect Gibson to have a solid week, and McLaurin could be a sneaky play. I don't think he's getting much attention in the DFS world uh, right now, and this could be a great spot for him to light it up. So Washington going to crush it on offense. Let's look at the Atlanta side there. Uh, it's kind of a wash everywhere. They're run blocking 14th. Washington is 11th against the run. Atlanta's 22nd uh, pass protection on offense, which is pretty poor, but Washington, surprisingly, only 23rd in generating any sort of pass rush. They've been really, really poor this uh, this year so far, which is strange. I thought they'd be a top five defense. So far, it looks like they've been pretty poor. So... With that being a wash everywhere, Atlanta, I would expect to score points uh, just from their main fantasy producers, which is probably going to be Kelvin Ridley and Kyle Pitts with a mixed in sprinkle, some reason, of Cordero Patterson. So watch out for those guys. Again, the Washington secondary has been really bad, and I don't think they're just good in in general, but their defensive line isn't helping them by not getting the quarterback at all. So uh, I think Ridley could be in store for a monster game this week. Like I said, like a Gibson and a Ridley skinny stack. These are games where I'm not doing like full on game stacks, but just getting one off pieces like a Gibson Ridley or a Gibson Pitts or a McLaurin Pitts, McLaurin Ridley. I think would be a smart idea for any sort of GPP lineup. Not sure how many people are going to be playing this game with all of the prior games that we listed before it as well. So 
keep that in mind. This could be sneaky GPP lineups um, where a guy has scored a huge amount of totals and kind of break the slate um, in this particular matchup. It just it looks not inviting uh, compared to some of the other ones, but it could be a back and forth battle with Gibson and McLaurin and Ridley Pitts and Cordero Patterson having some solid weeks. So keep that in mind. <clears throat> now we'll go on to the number seven slate, which actually brings us to the top suggested game total for Buffalo. They're actually it's a 47 and a half point over under from Vegas, but Buffalo is 16 and a half point home favorite. So they're the number one team implied total on the slate at almost 32 points there. Expect them to completely dominate Houston on the offensive side of the ball. Let's take a peek at Houston first, though. On offense, they're actually 10th in offensive pass protection, so they're pretty solid at protecting the quarterback there. They just can't run the ball. They're 30th in offensive run blocking. Buffalo number 6 in adjusted rush yards. Don't expect Houston to move the ball at all on the ground. Obviously, they're projected to be down big time against Buffalo, so I would expect a lot of pass attempts. And um, with that being said, I think the only pass game in town is Brandon Cooks there at Houston. I don't think you want to try to get cute anywhere else. So Brandon Cooks is definitely in play in this matchup. And then Buffalo's defense, I think, if we're going to see a lot of Houston pass attempts and uh, Buffalo being up by quite a bit, I could see Buffalo getting quite a few sacks, maybe uh, a strip sack, easy interceptions from a rookie quarterback there uh pick six possible but buffalo is going to be an expensive defense just keep that in mind now let's get to the buffalo side obviously i think they're going to be able to move the ball wherever they want they're number four in offensive pass protection houston is 19th in generating a pass rush buffalo a little bit better than average in offensive run blocking houston second to the worst in adjusted rush yards on defense so expect Buffalo to move the ball at will. Uh, the 32-point implied total is probably going to be low. I think uh, Buffalo might be able to score five or more touchdowns on Houston in this particular matchup. With that being said, pretty much everyone in Buffalo is in play. And you could do sort of an onslaught type of lineup here where you get Josh Allen and Zach Moss and a pass catcher or two from Buffalo and really, I think all the pass catchers from Buffalo would be in play here. So you're looking at uh, Stephon Diggs maybe finally having that huge breakout game. Cole Beasley's always a target monster. You're looking at Dawson Knox at tight end being a potentially sneaky play. If they're going to be scoring four or five touchdowns, six touchdowns potentially, and uh, getting the over on their team implied total, Dawson Knox might be getting one or two of those uh pass receptions in the end zone uh, also Gabe Davis in play Emmanuel Sanders has um, always had a bunch of air yards so he could have a monster week as I said I think this could be one of those times where you do an onslaught with Buffalo just get everybody on there run it back with Brandon Cooks and uh, cross your fingers that everyone kind of hits or Buffalo scores you know like 48 50 some points and you have Josh Allen, Zach Moss gets a few touchdowns, maybe one through the air like he has in the past recently here. Um, maybe Diggs will have that big week or Beasley, Emmanuel Sanders, Gabe Davis, Dawson Knox, any of those combo um, type of people. So this is a very interesting matchup anyway, uh, the Houston at Buffalo matchup. Just keep that one on your radar, especially the Buffalo side and Brandon Cooks for Houston. Otherwise, that's kind of the final game. We're going to start getting into some stinky games here. So the rest of them are 40, 45 and a half point totals or worse. Uh, we'll start here at the afternoon game, Pittsburgh at Green Bay. It's a 45 and a half point over under, as I had said. Green Bay, six and a half point home favorites there. And let's take a peek at Green, or excuse me, at Pittsburgh first. Offensive pass protection, 11th. Green Bay, middle of the road against the pass rush. That's kind of a wash. Pittsburgh, 32nd um, on offensive run blocking. So they are the absolute worst there. Green Bay, not very good at 23rd, but it doesn't really matter. That's still a, a, a matchup in their favor. 
I don't expect Pittsburgh to move the ball on the ground very well against Green Bay, so they're going to have to move the ball through the air. With that being said, we know Deontay Johnson having a knee injury. Even if he does come back, he's not going to be 100%, so don't expect him to be a target monster in his first week back if he does. Juju Smith-Schuster also left last week with an injury, and that left the door open for pretty much Claypool and James Washington to be the top two pass catching options in Pittsburgh but guess what if you saw the true north uh, podcast that I was on I actually mentioned this Deontay Johnson being gone being good for Harris Najee Najee Harris because Pittsburgh is not pushing the ball down the field Najee Harris obviously an underneath route runner so with that Pass protection and the pass game probably being the way that they're going to move the ball. I'd expect Najee Harris, uh, Claypool, and James Washington to be the beneficiaries of a lot more targets. You could also look at Pat Fryermuth, the tight end from Pittsburgh there. He might be a pretty smart option as well. Otherwise, I, I don't like this game particularly well for the Pittsburgh side. Let's look at the Green Bay side. They are favored here. Uh, offensive pass protection 17th versus Pittsburgh's 28th ranked pass rush. I think that's how they're going to move the ball is through the air. We look at run blocking. Green Bay is actually top 10, number 10 in offensive run blocking. However, Pittsburgh number 8 at the adjusted rush yard. So they are pretty stout against the run. I don't expect Green Bay to be able to move the ball as well as they could on the ground. So they're going to pass it. With that being said... MVS is injured this week. Adams is always the the play that you want in Green Bay. He's a threat for two or three touchdowns every single week. But with MVS being out, Lazard could be one of those sneaky uh, players that you get into your lineup and he gets you 80 yards and a touchdown or two. Um, could be one of those weeks for him. Otherwise, as I said, these games are starting to get into the the issue of you're not going to want to stack a lot of them. And as we saw in week two, uh, Green Bay is capable of moving the ball through the air via Aaron Jones. So he could be in play as well. Just keep that in mind. Um, but it looks like Pittsburgh's not going to generate much of a pass uh, rush against Green Bay. So I expect Adams to get peppered with targets. And if MVS is going to be out, Lazard's probably the biggest beneficiary of that in the past game if there's going to be a lot of time otherwise Robert Tunyon or Aaron Jones um, also in play we'll kind of zip through some of these last games here just they're not as sexy so tied for ninth place after the Pittsburgh and Green Bay at 45 and a half points we have the tied for ninth at 44 and a half point over under well, the first one is Tennessee at the New York Jets and we'll look at that. As I said, 44.5 point over under. We have Tennessee as 7 point road favorites. This is an interesting game for me just based off the adjusted line play report. This could be a lot closer than it looks, especially that minus 7 line. Um, I'm going to take the under on this. If you're going to be betting, as I said, Seattle, San Francisco, take the Seattle uh, victory at the plus points there. I would take this game hitting the under. So we look at Tennessee. They are the away team. Offensive pass protection, 27th. The Jets actually 10th at generating a pass rush. I don't expect Tennessee to be able to move the ball in the air very well against the Jets, just based off of this alone. Then we know A.J. Brown is out. We also know that Julio Jones is likely also out uh, with some sort of leg injury, unspecified leg injury. If he does play, he's not going to be a full 100%. He only played six snaps in the final half or in the second half of last week's game. So I don't like Tennessee moving the ball via the air. So they're going to have to do it on the ground. Which you might think, hey, that's good for Derrick Henry. He's going to get a lot more opportunities. Well, he already gets 30 opportunities a week. I don't know how much more he can get. And if there's no threat of a pass game, I don't think the Jets have to worry about that, and they can focus on stopping the run. As we look at it, Tennessee's only 21st in offensive run blocking. The Jets are 13th. That's kind of a favor in the Jets' uh, lineup, too. So with this being a seven-point uh, road favorite in Tennessee's favor, I, I could see this being a very sneaky uh 
as Andy Holloway would put it, uh, almost upset of the week. I think this might be a lot closer than people are going to be feeling comfortable with. I feel a lot of people are going to be playing Tennessee for their knockout games to or their survivor pools. They're going to be sweating this game, and it's very possible, as bad as the Jets have looked, that Tennessee might not be scoring a lot of points in this game either. So let's look at the Jets. Uh, pass protection, bad. 31st, Tennessee is 11th at generating a pass rush. Tennessee's defense could be sneaky here. I just don't see the Jets necessarily having a ton of uh, passing volume within this particular game. And then we see it's a wash in the run blocking. Jets versus Tennessee in the run blocking. Pretty much you don't want to play anybody from the Jets squad in DFS whatsoever, especially in cash. Uh, GPP dart throws, sure, but you're probably just flushing your money down the drain. As I said, this game I fully expect to hit the under, and I expect it to be a lot closer than what Vegas was saying with the seven-point Tennessee uh, favored there on the road. That could be a, a sneaky, sweaty game for those picking Tennessee in the survivor pool. Let's get on to the other 44.5-point total. Game number 13, Baltimore at Denver, another one that I would probably say is going to hit the under. So if we look at Baltimore, the offense might be a little overwhelmed by Denver's defense. We have them at 26 in offensive pass protection for Baltimore. Denver 13th at generating a pass rush. So that's a favor for Denver. They could be getting after Lamar. And then offensive run blocking, Baltimore is only 19th. Denver top 10 at number 9 in the adjusted rush yards on defense. So I don't expect Baltimore to be able to move the ball very well. We saw last week against Detroit, who's a far inferior defense to Denver. Baltimore struggled to even put up 20 points at Detroit. I don't know how they're going to fare at Denver in the altitude, out in the conditions. Denver's a much better defense. I don't see Baltimore doing better against Denver than they did against Detroit. So I don't expect Baltimore to be able to score or generate that many points. Um, yeah, otherwise, I just expect a low score. Maybe you can play Lamar if you think he's going to be under duress and have, you know, 12, 15 rush attempts for 130 yards and maybe a touchdown on the ground in this game. Otherwise, I don't see his upside being uh, all that pleasant in this particular matchup. Now let's look at the Denver side. Offensive pass protection 20th against Baltimore's 22nd ranked pass rush. Kind of a wash there. Denver run blocking 25th. Baltimore 4th against the rush. That is a big... Big mismatch in the favor of Baltimore's rush defense, so don't expect Denver to be moving the ball on the ground at all. They're going to have to do it through the air. With that being said, I think Noah Fant is going to be the best play from this particular matchup just because Baltimore has been bleeding points to the tight end, and Fant figures to get more targets with Jerry Judy out and K.J. Hamler out. That's probably 8, 9, 10 targets. A game that got to get spread out elsewhere. So Noah Fant, Albert Okuibunam, I believe, will also have a solid game this week. And then perhaps Cortland Sutton um, will see some pretty solid targets his way. Uh, Tim Patrick as well. But I just I don't see this being a very high-scoring affair. I could see both of these teams scoring less than 20 points and hitting the under on that 44.5 point total. So... Don't look for a whole lot of options from that squad or that particular game in DFS. And the games only get worse from here. So we got three left. Tied for 11th are Indianapolis at Miami and Detroit at Chicago. So we'll look at Indianapolis at Miami first. They are game number six. It's a 42 and a half point total, super low. And it's not even the lowest one on the slate. So 42 and a half point total. We have Miami as two point road, or excuse me, two point home favorites over Indianapolis. Um, the one thing, we'll look at the away team here first. Indianapolis, 23rd in offensive pass protection. Miami, 24th. That's kind of a wash there. And we know the quarterback situation in Indianapolis is not very good. Fortunately for Indianapolis, we see them at 7th in offensive run blocking, Miami at 17th in adjusted rush yards defense. I think this could be our Jonathan Taylor week. Hopefully he breaks 100 yards and pops off a couple touchdowns for those who have him in redraft, but 
out of this particular game, I think he's about the only person that I would play in any sort of DFS lineup. Um, more of a GPP play than a cash game option, just with the game being that low of a score. Um, but this is the biggest matchup and the uh, biggest mismatch in this entire game is the Indianapolis run blocking versus Miami's rush defense. Expect Jonathan Taylor to have the best matchup or the best game out of this entire matchup. Let's look at Miami. They're run blocking on offense 26, Indianapolis 27th. It's kind of a wash there. Offensive pass protection um, is 24th, Indianapolis 17th at generating a pass rush. Also similar, um, kind of a, uh, a wash there. With that being said, I don't know who on Miami I would be putting into any sort of redraft or DFS lineup uh, this particular week. It could be a Miles Gaskin if you think Indianapolis is going to be generating a little bit of pressure on Miami. Um, we did see Mike Gesicki and Jalen Waddle get quite a few targets with Jacoby Brissett last week, although I think that was a lot of garbage time stuff, and I don't know how much garbage time there's going to be in a two-point matchup with Indianapolis not putting up a whole ton of points. But if you think that's the way it's going to go, and Indianapolis will be getting a little bit of pressure on Miami, Waddle, Gesicki, and perhaps uh, Miles Gaskin getting some underneath dump-offs, but... Again, 42.5 point total. It's something that I'm avoiding. Uh, the other game that is a 42.5 point total is Detroit at Chicago. So they are the number three game here. As I said, 42.5 point over under. Chicago, three point home favorites. Another one of these, uh, just like the Indianapolis Miami game, you know, if you want to bet the uh, Indianapolis winning that, the plus money um, might not be that bad. Detroit, we'll get into it here. Um, I could see easily handling themselves on the road at Chicago. <clears throat> Let's look at their offense first, though. They're 16th in offensive pass protection, while Detroit is third in the pass rush on defense. I expect Chicago to be able to get after Jared Goff, and um, it's just going to be more dump-offs from Goff, even more so. Um, we look at the run blocking from Detroit 20 and Chicago 22. That's more of a wash there. I expect de Detroit to be able to move the ball on the ground a little bit easier than through the air. With that being said, it's a low-scoring affair. Pretty much the only pieces I'm going to want from Detroit are Swift and possibly Hawkinson. Jamal Williams has been productive. If you think Chicago is going to be getting after Detroit... Um, Jamal Williams and Swift could be the dump off options along with Hawkinson and that's why I said I think they're the only ones I would play. Detroit's defense is a sneaky play. They are more expensive on FanDuel but they're one of the cheapest options on DraftKings. So look at Detroit there. They're number four in generating a pass rush. Chicago as we saw just got obliterated by Cleveland last week. 32nd in offensive pass protection. Um, I think that's more on the Chicago side than it was on the Cleveland side. However, Detroit could easily find themselves in the midst of four or five sacks, uh, potentially a turnover or two there with Justin Fields if he is starting. So keep that in mind. On the Chicago side, let's take a peek at the offense. First, we saw the 32nd ranked pass protection on offense to Detroit's number four. Chicago is not going to have a lot of time to pass the ball which likely means they're going to have to look at the run game to move the ball anywhere. They're 28th in run blocking. Detroit's 26th, though. Somewhat of a wash. I would expect Chicago pretty much to only be able to move the ball on the ground or via the ground. So more of a David Montgomery-type week against Detroit. They have been ran on pretty much every single week so far, except for that Baltimore game. But... Uh, uh, Montgomery is probably the, the one player I'm going to be looking at from Chicago um, in any sort of capacity. I don't know if I want to chase the pass attack on such a low uh, score there with Justin Fields if he does play or Mooney. Um, they could hook up for one deep one, but probably not a game that I'm going to be looking to stack. As I had said, these are some pretty grossly low totals. And finally, let's get to the 13th game on the slate. New York Giants at New Orleans. This is the lowest one on the slate at 42. We do have New Orleans actually as 7.5 point home favorites. So New York Giants only a 17 point implied total, which is super low. 
They are on the road at New Orleans, which I'm not sure where this is being played yet because of Hurricane Ida. I believe New Orleans is still playing maybe in Jacksonville, but... Um, offensive pass protection for the Giants, 21 versus New Orleans, 27th ranked pass rush defense. Well, we look at their run blocking, New York Giants, 31st offensive run blocking, New Orleans, third in the adjusted rush yard. So don't expect the Giants to be able to run the ball at all. Bad news for Barkley's rush attempts. However, the pass protection, 21st versus New Orleans, 27. Kind of a wash there. Fortunately for Barkley, the Giants don't really have a ton of talent on the offensive pass-catching side. Evan Ingram, uh, Galladay's a little bit banged up. Sterling Shepard is in there. Uh, Slayton, uh, with that kind of talent there, Barkley does command a little bit higher target share. And if New Orleans, um, it was kind of a wash there. They might be able to get after the Giants more than they're used to. If not, uh, the Giants might have a little bit more time to pass, so... Uh, a low total. I wouldn't be starting Daniel Jones anywhere in particular. Um, but if they're going to be moving the ball through the air, you might be able to do a one-off on Evan Ingram. Uh, if you think Barkley is going to get quite a few targets, he could be a play in DraftKings if he is cheap over there, which I believe he is. Otherwise, on the New Orleans side, we look at the offensive pass protection, 28th, New York Giants, 25th, that generating a pass rush, that's kind of a wash. Run blocking for New Orleans, 11th, the Giants, 21st in defense against the rush yards. So I expect New Orleans to be able to move the ball on the ground a lot more efficiently than through the air. They haven't been one to pass the ball much anyway, so I think this is essentially an Alvin Kamara type of situation where he will be running the ball 20 plus times and hopefully getting you four or five targets in that pass game as well. But again, this is a game low point total, not looking to stack a lot of the options on here. And that will finish it up for us this week, guys. Thank you very much for getting through some of these garbage totals at the very end here. And I thank you very much for the bang sponsorship hashtag not actually a sponsor i don't want to get sued by a bang for saying <laughs> that they sponsor something that they actually don't but they're keeping my throat nice and moist and uh getting me through this adjusted line play report for week four thanks for watching everybody please smash that subscribe button let's get some dfs money together just use this adjusted line play tool this adjusted line play report to help you make better decisions on your lineups and who you should be putting in on FanDuel who you should be putting in on DraftKings based off of what you see their line play or the the people in the trenches are doing you can use this in combination with all of your other DFS tools and use it to absolutely dominate some of your lineups so with that being said, I think we're going to peace out for week four. Send me some Twitter love at Toddzilla1337 if you use any of this information and win some money. I would love to see it. Anyway, guys, let's go out there and win some money together. That's it for the week four DFS show. Thanks for watching, and uh, let's go win some money. Bye.